In the mid-1950s, an unassuming radio executive accidentally made an amazing discovery. He could travel outside the confines of space and time using only his mind. But once agents from the U.S. government got wind of his methods, they wanted to use it to spy on enemies. Are you willing to detach from your physical self and travel through space and time? Follow the instructions in this declassified CIA report and try it for yourself. This week's episode is The Gateway Experience. Sinisterhood. Well, this is a very appropriate thing for me to be reading about while I was in Marfa, which is kind of a weird uh, for my anniversary trip. You know, it's like this, like, uh, I had a lot of space and silence around me. And so I'm like laying on the back porch, like, I will ascend. <laughs> I did not ascend, unfortunately. You did an astral project. No. I did not either. I was camping in the woods and also had a lot of um, space around me. Um, but I was worried about just keeping my kid alive. So yeah. I didn't do any <laughs> astral projecting. It was equal, as Tommy said, it was equal parts fun and traumatizing. The strip was. <laughs> It's After a core memory. It will getting, be. Uh, she got smacked in the face with a giant walking stick. It was just hurled right at her head. <laughs> and then she fell in the fire pit and burned her hands. So it was, um, I'm still recovering. It was very traumatic yeah. witnessing all of these things. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, it's going to be like she's 35 being like, yeah, like the one time when I fell in a fire pit at camping and you're like, stop bringing it up, all right? <laughs> like that's what we do in my family at least. <laughs> Um, she can bring it up all she wants because it was traumatizing, but yeah. could have been a lot worse. Luckily, she Good. came out relatively unscathed, but, uh, I would have astral projected all of us to another location if <laughs> given the opportunity at that point. Yeah, be like, I'm trying gotta, to get to focus 21. I got to work on my, uh, yeah, my concentration. I did listen to some, uh, binaural beats for anxiety. And I'll tell you what, I didn't project, but I did fall immediately asleep. So there's something there. Yeah, I like it. Uh, I listened to one of the Monroe Institute, which is the organization we'll be talking about today, one of their tapes uh, that I found it very relaxing and I had a really nice dream. I just don't know if I traveled anywhere, but uh, we're going to have to travel terrestrially, I think, for our upcoming tour since our astral yeah. projection is not very good we're going to be traveling by <laughs> by plane and by car maybe by astral projection maybe we'll by see. that point we'll get good but we do have finally our cities to announce yeah we're gonna head back out on tour if you have not seen our full moon energy tour yet we can't wait for you to see it in your town you'll hear all about the darker side of the moon what it does to us what lurks up there and what people really think happened during the apollo mission so we cover legend lore mysterious macabre all of your favorite things about sinisterhood but all circulated right around the moon and we're coming to some pretty badass cities i can't wait for all the details, including dates, times, venues, and more, go to Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. And we're going all over the place. Some Midwest dates. We have some East Coast dates, some West Coast dates, and right down the middle. So we're ending it all here in Dallas on October 17th. So yeah, head to our website and uh, get your tickets before they are gone. But uh, you don't need a ticket to this show, which is the show inside your mind. <laughs> well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Beginning in 1947, the United States had its eye on the Soviet Union. The rivalry that developed between the two nations led to the space race, moon landing, the invention of satellites, and many developments in defense, like ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons. But one weapon that neither the Soviets nor the Americans could harness entirely was one located between each of our ears. According to the National Institute of Health, Everyone needs sleep, but its biological purpose remains a mystery. Recent studies indicate that sleep plays a role in cleansing the brain of toxins, but the role of dreaming is debated. Some psychologists believe it is a way for the brain to process and consolidate memories. Others believe the dreams are an accidental byproduct of the brain being in sleep mode. Many religions and cultures point to dreams as a source of wisdom and guidance, and even a gateway into traveling to other places in time and space. 
One of the books I got from the library kind of just I went to go get a, a book that is by a person we're going to talk about. But next to it was one called Psycho Navigation. And mm. it was about this guy who's traveled the world and stayed with different tribes and different cultures and learned about how they utilize uh, dream messages to help one another. Essentially, like he was in uh, a really remote village in the mountains in Ecuador and a jaguar came out of the the greenery and started attacking people and it was like oh, that doesn't usually happen and three days later uh some members of a tribe that was from very far away but knew how to fight jaguars came over and said we had a dream that a jaguar was attacking you is it and they said yes can you help and they said yes we'll defeat it for you like we'll wow. help you it's, and he said there's like they don't have phones they don't yeah. have electricity like there's just no way other than this guy's like i'm the shaman and i had the dream that you're suffering i could hear your cries i could see the jaguar i knew you needed me do you need me and they're like so much yes please <laughs> it's like mental ghostbusters you just yeah call them. All, everyone they're all tuned in to the same frequency bob monroe was living in new york city in the 1950s working in the broadcasting industry as what he described in his book as a reasonably orthodox business executive author of reading the enemy's mind paul smith described bob as Gruff, poker playing, and hard smoking. Bob was exploring the concept of hypnopedia, or sleep learning, where people listened to tapes as they slept in order to learn things subconsciously. He became curious about the concept of consciousness and where our minds go when we are not in waking life after he underwent a strange experience in 1958. When he lied down and relaxed, he could quiet his conscious mind and found himself moving away from his physical body into what he called the second body. After allowing a vibrating sensation to come over his body and being faced with a bright light, Bob would roll to the side and sit up, allowing him to look back at his sleeping physical self. Bob was experiencing what is now commonly referred to as an out-of-body experience, or OBE a term which he is credited with creating. He formally defined OBEs as an event in which the experiencer, one, seems to perceive some portion of some environment which could not possibly be perceived from where his physical body is known to be at the time, and two, knows at the time that he is not dreaming or fantasizing. During the OBE, Bob would maneuver his second body to explore what he called Locale One, the first plane of consciousness appeared to Bob like the world as it currently is, and within it, Bob was able to visit friends and colleagues at remote locations. After conducting these visitations, Bob would make notes on the time, place, and what he observed while gone. He would then call up those he visited and compare what they were doing to what he saw. And this pretty much is, uh, he would just type them out like in very kind of clinical terminology of like uh, twisted out of my body. And that's like physically what it is, is he would like rotate almost like a log. Although later on, he said he just half set up. So half of him was out of his body and his legs were still in. I was like, that's so eerie. You like, you look around and like half of you is in and out. But he would just like go, mm, I'm going to go visit Dr. Smith today. And then just imagine and like go into this vibration. He would be like, the vibrations came on easily today and then would see something and then just wake up and write it and then call to compare notes. And sometimes he was spot on. And other times he was like, ah, that felt more like a dream. And you know, he could write it off. It was, it seemed like it was once every few weeks he could actually do this thing. That wasn't just a dream. I don't know that I love the idea of me just minding my own business. And then I get a phone call and someone's like, Hey, I saw that you were um, just like eat, binge watching Love Island on the couch and eating like five bags of Cheetos. Is everything okay? And I'm like, what? How did you know that? And they're like, they well, the I showed up. I astral projected there and I was just looking at you. It's like, <laughs> I want to consent before you just show up in my house undetected and see what I'm doing. You're so right. He did that to a lady. And he, she, he said that at the time she didn't notice, like she didn't call, like um, say anything to him. But he said he felt himself standing in her living room. I think she was reading or something. And then he called later and she's like, was that you? I saw a weird gray mist in my living room. And I was like, Bob, get out of here. And she's like, next time you're coming through, tell me it's you. So I know that it's you and I'm not scared. And he was like, I'm sorry, I was yelling, but I did like, you couldn't hear me. I don't know how to do it. And uh, you got to call him up beforehand and be like, hey, I'm about to take a nap. <laughs> 
and I may Wink. be, and she's like, well, I'm about to get in the shower. So could you hold off? Like you got to like, let no. people know. <laughs> I'm going to see right now. He visited one lady on vacation though. And he was like, he, she was talking to two women he didn't recognize, which he later learned were her nieces, but he didn't know her nieces were going to be there. But he was, she was in the living room and he said her physical body kept talking, but her kind of second body looked and said, Hey Bob, I see that you're here. And he said, will you remember I'm here? And she said, yes. And he said, I don't believe that that's true. Hang on. And then he pinched the shit out of her. He said he pinched her so hard on the side, it left a mark. And then she said she like jumped, her physical body jumped. And then he went back. Then a few days later, he called and goes, how was your vacation? And she's like, well, I was sitting in the kitchen, having minding my own business. And all of a sudden I got my, had this really painful part, like pinching sensation on my side and then she showed it and he she had a bruise and he's like hey sorry that was me you said you were gonna remember and i wasn't sure you would so i pinched you get out of my space bob he was trying so you gotta hard. be you gotta <laughs> astral project but with consent if That's you're gonna what, do it you can't just be, like, be a one party thing He's like, I can't tell him because that'll set him up. I'm like, well, then you're just like, ha ha. Yeah. Like you're just they, a ghost they, in their What house. if they don't want to be uh, spied on right at that you're moment? have a vacation and you're just like, oh. no, no. That part of it I don't love. I feel like you got to yeah. or you got to like do it to places like, you know, the Grand Canyon or something where like <laughs> it's an open it's public, public place every, it's, you know, like whatever. And then. Nobody's going to feel like you intruded on them. <laughs> yeah, or injured them just so you would. He's like, yeah. I had to make sure she would remember. It's like sometimes people get so single-mindedly focused on like an objective that they disregard the feelings of others. Yeah. And that sort of happened a little here. Well, he was a gruff, hard-smoking <laughs> poker player. So he <laughs> was all about the pinch. He's like, I'm all in. <laughs> Eventually, Bob consulted experts. He asked a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and a doctor what their take on the visitations could be. They were unable to explain instances where Bob saw things that he could not have otherwise known. In one case, he visited a friend who was holding a seance at her house. Bob did not know who would be present, but when he visited with his second body, he was able to see the attendees and hear their conversation, even though the seance was happening many miles away from Bob. The answer from the experts shocked Bob and sent him on a journey that changed the course of his life. They advised him to keep experimenting and to take note of his experiences. It's a real 50s doctor thing of like, you probably got something weird in your blood. Yeah, just do <laughs> more. I don't know. Just uh, like, do more. Tell. Take notes and let us know because maybe this is something that, you know, we want to look into. And we, But we're not going to like do the research. We'll just use yours and then go from there. Yeah, go for it. I mean, this is, he owned two companies, Bob owned two companies. And he mm -hmm. said right around this time, he was converting radio companies to being television companies. And he's like, we figured that it ended up, that was really easy. He's like, it was the same thing we were doing only now with cameras. So once that was over with, those businesses are set. They have shareholders, they're functioning. He opened another business where he did like secret research. And he was like, I don't want to tell anybody what I was doing. Cause I was afraid they were going to think I was crazy. Well, I don't know about crazy, but I would be like, it's a little voyeuristic, Bob. Maybe we should do something where, like, everyone knows what's going on. Everyone's cool with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had RAM Enterprises, and then that became later, we'll talk about the Monroe Institute. He was, he had his hand in all sorts of stuff, and his whole body. He was, he had his whole body and everybody's <laughs> stuff, honestly. <laughs> Bob described his experiences in a later book called Journeys Out of the Body. In it, he explains that in order to conduct a visitation, one must think of a person rather than a place. By thinking of his target, Bob would be transported to the destination, explaining in the book. You can watch the landscape move under you if you wish, but it's a little disconcerting when you rush headlong toward a building or a tree and go right through it. In order to avoid such traumas, forget about seeing during the traveling process. You never quite get over the physical body conditioning that such things are solid. I don't know. Good I think advice. it would be kind of cool to hurdle like just straight towards a building and then you just go right through it. I wanted to ask you in your dreams, because you fly in your dreams, if I'm if, we, if you're cool to discuss this. Oh, yeah, I had a uh, the past two nights have been something else. 
<laughs> well, he describes flying in his dreams, and I know you fly like with almost mm-hmm. a um, what's the word that we always say, like a lucid dreaming style. Mm-hmm. And he describes pushing up with his body and like pushing his arms up in the air, mm-hmm. and that's how he's like able to fly in these dreams. And I was like, this kind of sounds like stuff Christy's talking about. That is about how before. I do it. Yeah, I push off the ground. Mm-hmm. And uh, kick my feet, but also like like you're kind of swimming through the air to get up. And mm-hmm. but then like once I'm like going, I can just kind of like kick my feet and and sail through the air. But and I am often flying to um, get away from things or to save things. It's not all. It's usually not like happy flying. But also, yeah, I don't really like- have happy dreams. <laughs> all my dreams are very dark and fucked up. <laughs> Well, that's that's not good. That there, I mean, that, that's not a fun place. He was going to these places and like swimming through the air and like seemingly having a pretty good time. Mm-hmm. But it was just that the physical description of how he flew. I was like, that sounds familiar. Mm-hmm. But he did talk about that. It's almost like. Uh, in any of the cartoons you watch where someone's like a ghost for the first time and they don't, they like hesitate or I think it's in Harry Potter. He like is supposed to go through the wall and if you hesitate, it'll hit you. So he was just like, just think of a person and you'll just be there and don't worry about how you get there. I was like, I would, I might worry about how I got there. I would think of a person, but you got to think of them like on um, a tropical island. So then you just show up on the beach and not in their (laughs) bathroom while they're dropping a deuce. Yeah, he did say, he goes, I just thought of my doctor, who I knew at the time should have been in bed sick, and I just thought of him, and then he ended up seeing him out walking around, and he's like, that's weird, he's got the flu, he should be asleep, and then when he finally woke up and he called him, they said, oh, sorry, we went out to the post office earlier, he thought he it'd be better for him to get up and, like, go out, so he was out, and he's like, can you tell me the color of his overcoat, and it was the same coat that he had seen him, but it was like, because he thought about seeing him in bed, and then he didn't, he ended up seeing him out mm. somewhere else, so it's like, it'll just take you to them regardless of where they're at so they might be on the pot (laughs) (laughs) bob described the automatic navigational system as being too accurate it works by what and of whom you think let one small stray thought emerge dominantly for just one microsecond and your course is deviated when bob ended up in places other than he intended usually by some distracted thought he found himself at times seen by people he did not know. In one case, he sat upon a house's eve, lost on one of his journeys. A woman doing yard work below him looked up directly at me. With a frightened start, she scuttled into the house, slamming the door. He mused, I wonder what she saw sitting on the eve. Well, I don't know, but this is why it would be very hard for me to do this. Because it's impossible for me to just think of one thing and not let distracting thoughts in. So I'd be headed, you know, to your house and then something pops in my head that's like, oh, man, gosh, it's some catastrophe. Like there was that tsunami the other day in, uh, you know, across the world. And then I'm just like in the middle of the ocean and a tsunami because (laughs) I can't just focus on one thing. That's why meditation and stuff is always so hard for me because... My brain just lets in everything. That's what he he explained that part of this is it, you have to like work because he said not most people are like that, but a lot of people are like that where you're like, oh, and then that happens and then that happens. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of like the the sound is to, supposed to help you stop doing that. But that's the dangerous thing. It's because if you think of one thing, you're gone. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure in that of like, I only have to focus on this one thing or I'm just going to my course is completely <laughs> altered. And scared the shit out of some lady trying to rake her leaves. Right. And she just looks up and sees this. God. I don't. What was he up there? Just he's some smoking. Like, <laughs> some gargoyle perched. And she's like, ah. Yeah. He's just up there playing poker. Smoking <laughs> on her eve. <laughs> As Bob continued stepping out of his physical body, he delved deeper into the subconscious locations. While locale one looked like everyday life and Bob recognized those he was visiting, Bob said locale two could best be described as a room with a sign over the door saying, please check all physical concepts here. He postulated that locale two is a non-material environment with laws of motion and matter only remotely related to the physical world. He stated that locale two was more the natural environment of the second body, which was not of our physical world. In locale two. Reality is composed of deepest desires and most frantic fears. Thought is action, and no hiding layers of conditioning or inhibition shield the inner you from others. 
This area included some souls who were alive but asleep or drugged, or those who recently died but were unsure where to go next. Bob encountered a park-like area with hundreds of people strolling around that he interpreted as a waiting place where newly arrived souls wait for friends or relatives to take them along to another place where they, quote, belonged. He he mentions re- uh, every once in a while, like, sexual feelings. And he said that in locale, too, many of the, the beings are, like, frantic or have, like, sexual purposes or will try to glom on or grab onto you. And he said he found that the best thing is to just, like, stand still. He said it's like a school of fish in the ocean. Like, they'll come around you. And he's, like, he just would wait until they left him. And then he would, like, move on, try to move on past locale, too. It sounds but, almost like... Yeah. Um, purgatory or something where it's kind of this waiting place and some people are confused some people might understand but they don't want to be there and it it not like a a calm happy place kind of chaotic yeah and he said he didn't love it there and he did feel sad because before he saw the park a little boy approached him and had said you where's my family where do i go Mm -hmm. and he said he didn't know what to do so he just hugged him and said um somebody that you love very much will be here for you soon but i have to go now because he was like i knew i wasn't this kids but he's Mm -hmm. like you just kind of know and he said i didn't want to make any proclamations or anything and then the next time he visited the kid wasn't there and then he later visited this park like area and he's like it gave him a good sense of peace that like Perhaps it's a, you know, it's like a train station for the afterlife. Everybody's just kind of waiting to get picked up. Mm -hmm. Again, the thought is action scares me because I got a lot of thoughts and they just pop in. And if that then turns into action, uh, who knows where where that's going to lead. It, that's kind of what he warns against of like, it could be your deepest, worst fears. And mm-hmm. so uh, a lot of the CIA report, which we'll get to, and then also the Monroe Institute uh, concepts are working on yourself and your own like self-knowledge and being able to train your brain to go, those are thoughts. I am catastrophizing. That's not real. Like stop and go away. Otherwise, if you like let them take over, I think the idea is that like you're going to become like sort of trapped in a prison of your own making in oh, this well, like locale that's... too. That is the title of my autobiography. <laughs> so I full transparency had to take a Xanax before this episode because it's just like a lot. It makes I like the concept of it and I would love mm-hmm. to be able to hone in on it and master something like this so I could have more control over my thoughts and feel more present. It's the well, the margin for error is high, and if you fuck up, you really fuck up. <laughs> that and it gets me a bit. <laughs> I did talk to because I I do want to try to do this more. And in Marfa, I went to this apothecary slash. Uh, it's like a witchy store, and I talked to this wonderful woman who worked there, who's a death doula, and I told her, oh, I said, wow. you know. I go, of all places, I feel like I'm not going to get judged for asking this, but I'm looking to Astral Project. And she's like, of course, tell me what you're trying to do. Like, there was zero judgment. And um, she was just like, that's in different cultures. And she said, you know, it depends on what lineage carrier, which I really like that term that she's like that you work with. She's like, my lineage carrier is an Ojibwe woman. And this, you know, thus and such. So she was explaining like whatever source you get stuff from. And I think that's what kind of went wrong with Bob here is that he was just like fucking around. Like he didn't know Mm. what he was doing. He would just like lay down and start doing this versus like the psycho navigation book or this woman finding people where it's like, listen, white man, you didn't invent this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You stumbled into something that people have been doing for millennia. And she was explaining that in a lot of her, their death doula practices, if they want the spirit to return back to the body, that the feet is very grounding and to grab your feet. He did not say this in any of his books, but that's kind of my like, if shit is going sideways, I'm just going to grab my feet because she said that that will bring you back. So she's just like, with intention, grab your feet like I'm coming home. I'm coming back to my body. Um, and so she was like that way. I go, what if I panic while I'm out there? <laughs> she was like, grab your panic. feet. Grab I didn't feet. know death doulas were a thing, but that that makes sense. And I, I love to hear that. Sounds like yeah, a very like a- comforting and nurturing profession. Absolutely. Bob discovered Locale 3 by accident in late 1958. After rotating out of his physical body, he found himself staring into the black darkness of a hole beside him the same shape as his body. He wrote, Beyond, through the hole, was nothing but blackness. It was not the blackness of a dark room, but a feeling of infinite distance and space. Bob experimented with placing a hand through the hole, 
which was first clasped and shaken by another hand on the other side. His hand was grabbed again and again through the hole on multiple successive journeys before he finally pulled himself through. He said at one point when he put his hand through a hook went in it that it didn't hurt, but that it felt like he was like being pulled and that he would just like each time it was like they were trying to be like, come on, you can come through. And he just panicked each time because he was like, it did not look like before. And it was not where I had been before. If I stick my hand through a black hole into darkness of any kind and another hand grabs it, I'm out. I'm pulling back. (laughs) If you see a dark hole, best case scenario, it's like cold spaghetti and they're trying to trick you into yeah. that it's spiders or Peeled intestines grapes or whatever. and their yeah. eyeballs. But <laughs> exactly. something grabs you. It's like, what was that movie? That horror movie that recently came out with the hand? Was it called oh, The Hand? The, no. It should be. No. Oh, what, I know what you're talking about, though, where it grabbed their hand and it was like the urban legend back. and yeah. The A24 movie. Yeah. Everyone's yeah, yeah. yelling it. Between that and Insidious, these have both been like, there's a reason why people write horror movies about this. <laughs> <laughs> After swimming through the dark nothingness, Bob eventually entered another world, writing. Locale 3, in summary, proved to be a physical matter world almost identical to our own. He described houses, trees, streets, people, and a reasonably civilized society. However, upon further examination, Bob determined it can be neither the present nor the past of our physical matter world. Scientific developments were different. There were no electrical devices whatsoever. While there were trains and cars, they seemed to run on something that produced radiation rather than our regular electricity. Yeah, he said the car you drove with like a stick and that it was bigger, almost not quite the size of a train car, but he said the roads were a lot wider and the cars were bigger and it was like a horizontal bar that you pulled back and forth to steer. It sounds uh, exhausting, quite honestly, yeah. <laughs> but these uh, <laughs> these types of things are fascinating. Like world, it's like bizarro world where yeah. things are kind of the same, but some things are like drastically different. And if you found yourself in that world, There'd be such a huge learning curve that that, I think, in and of itself would be very terrifying to a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Like if you, I don't know, get zapped into the behind the wheel of a car, or behind the stick of a car that you've never driven before. Yeah. And you're like, oh, no, which is what <laughs> happened to Bob. And he crashed the car. It sounds like a um, like an old timey train thing, mining, where they would like mm-hmm. on one side, like pump it and then it would go mm-hmm. down a train track type of thing. Yeah, he's like, it was weird because it looked like our world, but it was a little shittier. And it was like, they thought it was great. They're like, yeah, this is how you drive a car. And it was just like, there's a better way. (laughs) You're like, (laughs) how do you explain that? (laughs) You go in, you go, hey, there's a better way. And then become a millionaire. Ella asked me the other day, who invented the first ever car? And we explained to her like Henry Ford. But in this timeline, it's like Bob Monroe. He yeah. came out of nowhere and he had all the answers. He knew everything about like how to start it. And then like we immediately went from like just kind of a cool car to like, I think he called it a Tesla. And you're like, yeah, we have the advancements like when you've seen it all at once, you can go in and just give them the best thing. They don't have to go through all the shitty cars first. That's how you find time travelers or interdimensional travelers. It's like where you get all these good ideas from. Mm-hmm. They're like, nowhere. You're like, liar. <laughs> Strangest of all, Bob was able to merge with someone living in that alternate universe. After the first time he merged, each successive time he visited, he would enter this man's body and take over the controls. Bob knew this man's biographical background and popped into his body while the man was working in his outdoor shed, spending time with his wife, or driving the wife and two children in the car on a family vacation to the mountains. Each time, Bob would have no context of the situation and found himself unable to interact, eliciting suspicion from those he spoke with. He well, visited this man so many times and ruined his life, in my opinion, because that's what he, I'm like, saying. Bob just keeps popping into people and nobody's asking for this. And if you're just like driving in the car with your kids and wife and you're just like, hey, dad, oh, look at the. And then he just goes silent and like, and it's like <gasps> his eyes gloss over and he's like catatonic. That's terrifying. 
That's what she, he said that when he was working in the shed, he was inventing some type of theater, um, like basically like a theater in the round with some like cool lighting and stuff. He's like, the guy was clearly like a theater production designer, but he didn't, Bob was just like looking at what he was doing and the wife and some friends come in and she's like, I am so proud of him. He's going to tell you all about his invention, babe, tell us about the invention. And he's like, I panicked cause I didn't know what to say. So I just stood there with my mouth open and she looked at me all suspiciously and mad and then left. And then each time he would pop in, it would be like a different part of the this relationship so on the mountain trip he crashed the car on the mountain trip God and then damn. left and then later on the wife and him got separated the, I bet because she's like you just don't talk to me the way you used to you're not the she same was like, person <laughs> when was, you were when we got married She's like, you don't listen. And so then she said, he said that when he was there one time, she told him, I'm leaving you. And if you want to find where we are, here's the place. And she told Bob, who then uh. sucked out before writing it down. So then the next time he visited, the man was so fucking depressed and couldn't find his family. Like, I kind of hate this. Bob. I'm going to be like- I'm, the more I find out about Bob, the less I like him. I mean, it was, it's one of those where you appreciate the concepts that he brought to the forefront, but my God, man, you didn't know what you were doing and you, like you, there was consequences. Allegedly. I mean, this is also. It could be all made up. Yeah. I mean, we're all taking what this guy said at face value, (laughs) but nobody has been able to contact alternate universe Bob and be like, Hey, here's where your family is in case you want to go find them. But if this did happen, like. That's devastating. There was a, really um, like- <laughs> a black mirror, kind of the one with, uh, what's his name from breaking bad? Jesse. Yeah. I don't Aaron Paul. It. Yes. Uh, the one with him is kind of reminded me of this where mm-hmm. somebody can just kind of like take over the kind of like a body snatcher type of situation. Mm-hmm. And in that one, the wife knew she was dealing with the other one to a point, but mm-hmm. also like, it's not fair to anybody involved. Again, I'm I'm big on consent, and I feel like all of his little pop-ins are very non-consensual <laughs> and oftentimes just creates total chaos. This was like, you're ruining this guy's life. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's just like, yeah, the last time I saw him, things were really bad for him. Anyway, I never visited again, and it's Good. like, you probably couldn't. Yeah, or you got to visit him again. And write down write that address so he knows <laughs> yes. where to go find his family. Write a confession or something so his wife doesn't think that he's just gaslighting her. Right? She's like, I told you. And he's like, that was the other guy. He jumps in my body. She's like, yeah, sure, Terry. That's fine. Yeah. It's like, you you got to admit. You got to fess up. Who's going who's gonna to believe something like that? No. Nah. Bob concluded that Locale 1 and Locale 3 were not the same, given the difference in scientific development. In fact, he described Locale 3 as even less scientifically advanced and guessed it could possibly be another Earth type world located in another part of the universe, which is somehow accessible through mental manipulation or a memory of a physical Earth civilization that predates known history or even perhaps an antimatter duplicate of this physical Earth world where we are the same but different. Whatever you got to tell yourself to sleep at night, Bob. (laughs) To to that last part, I say, then jump into your alternate (laughs) self and not someone else's. Just ruin this man's life. You got to find alternate reality Bob, see what he's up to. He's probably in that world like, okay, everybody, is it okay that we all um, sit around and share our feelings? He's very like make sure that everyone is okay with what's going on and gets their consent before doing anything. And then this Bob Bob comes in and wrecks it. Yeah, he's more considerate than this one. Bob's journeys culminated in the development of the Monroe Institute of Applied Sciences. Created in 1972, the Institute conducts experimental research in the field. According to Bob, the Institute's research attracted the interest and participation of physicists, psychologists, biochemists, engineers, educators, psychiatrists, and statisticians. Monroe wanted to scientifically measure and study the journeys he had been going on. With the Institute, he was able to develop methods to get into the necessary state of consciousness quickly and consistently and record the methods on audio cassette tapes. The goal was to alter brainwave functions into a concentrated state, such that the participant could escape the restrictions of space and time, traveling like Bob through the various locales. The foundation of the Institute's method lies in the creation of hemi-sync sound frequencies. 
the different sound frequencies, or binaural beats, would play in different sides of the user's headphones, activating the right brain while quieting the more logical left brain to bring on an out-of-body experience. According to Psychology Today, the auditory illusion occurs when two tones of slightly different frequencies are played in separate ears simultaneously. When heard through the headphones, the human brain detects the creation of a third tone. The frequency of the third tone is the mathematical difference between the other two tones. So if you had one in one ear that was like 140 hertz and the other ear was um, 100 hertz, then the difference between that is what your, your brain kind of hears, which might be a frequency that you can't hear otherwise, but it's this kind of auditory illusion that, that happens when you do that. It's a brain hack. And then I think it's probably not a coincidence that he was a radio guy and worked mm. with sound engineers and was like, hey, we need to create like a some like what happens to the brain when you're in deep meditation? How do we then hack that and reverse engineer it and stick it through your ear holes? And they were like, we got you, Bob. Mm -hmm. You're going to ask con consent, right? And he's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bob wrote three books, starting with 1971's Journeys Out of the Body. He then had his hemisync technology patented in 1975. Around the same time, the CIA became interested in Bob's gateway process. In his second book, Far Journeys, published in 1985, Bob explains that in the mid-70s, he and his colleagues at the Institute were developing a way to train others in Bob's methods and recognized... We were creating for the participant a doorway, a window, a gap through which he could achieve other states of consciousness. Thus, it became known as the Gateway Program. The Soviets had been experimenting with remote viewing in 1972, according to a classified U.S. military report, and some at the CIA wanted to utilize the concept for the Americans. The U.S. government began engaging in experiments with remote viewing in a top-secret study called Project Stargate, a highly classified program that explored the potential of psychic abilities and remote viewing for military and intelligence applications. This program aimed to train individuals to physically see and gather information from distant locations or about hidden objects and was shut down in the 1990s. And this is, we could do a whole separate other episode on Project Stargate, but uh, it, this is, uh, it, it's funny to me that Bob had the Institute and then just like members of the military were like, can we attend some of these? And he's like, okay. But it wasn't really like, we'll work with the military. They just like let them show up. And so the one book I got is by Paul Smith, who is a retired army intelligence officer who went through it. Colonel McDonald, who later wrote the report, went through it and they just got invited to come to the Institute and basically say like, okay, we're going to do a truncated version. It'll be like seven days instead of seven weeks and you get this dorm room and in the dorm rooms a pod with like a window and curtains on the side and there's speakers in your pod and you just like go in your pod and they would wake you up with wake up music and then they would do these like 60 to 90 minute sessions and then come together and like discuss it afterwards but in retrospect you're like the u.s military is like sending like 30 soldiers and army intelligence officers to do it so the general in charge was he was tasked with like figure out if this is something we can use and so no matter what you're gonna seem like kind of weird that you're like i take the guys to the psychic camp that's me <laughs> we are trying to create the ultimate soldier that can astral project and spy on other countries and get uh, intelligence and everything without even having to leave the confines of their own little, you know, American station. And that's, I mean, if Bob's popping into people's houses and seeing all sorts of stuff, if different uh, military can pop into each other's like bases, that is a whole other can of worms. Right. And I heard a quote from Jimmy Carter. It was like a 2016 quote. And he they asked him, what's like the weirdest thing that ever happened when you're president? And he said that they used a remote viewer to find a plane that had gone down in like enemy territory. And they were she was able to say exactly where it was and to find it. And he's like, I've never been able to explain that because he said everybody else we talked to, the geographers, the physicists, that everybody was doing the math of where it should be. They could not find it. And uh, he's like, I've never been able to explain that. But thinking of it in sinister terms, like if you were like, oh, we need to find where the enemy's base camp is and destroy them. 
Mm -hmm. You just would use a remote viewer to do it. So it would be extremely dangerous. So you can see why the government's like, the Soviets are doing it. Mm -hmm. We're doing it too. We got to do it too. In 1983, Wayne M. McDonnell of the U.S. Army Intelligence and Security Command submitted his report to the CIA called Analysis and Assessment of Gateway Process. The document was declassified in 2003 and fully released in 2021. McDonald broke down the gateway process in his 29-page report, discussing the various scientific principles that make it possible. He touched on quantum mechanics, astronomy, and religious beliefs that support the possibility for there being alternative states of consciousness. The report's purpose was clear, to find practical applications of the gateway program for the U.S. government to utilize. In writing it, McDonald states that his goal was to... Construct a scientifically valid and reasonably lucid model of how consciousness functions. In order to put... Out-of-body states into the language of physical science to remove the stigma of its occult connotations. Now this part I like because I watched like a 30-minute YouTube breakdown of this whole thing. This guy's channel is called The Y-Files. And I thought he explained it so well. I think I'm late to the game. He has hundreds of thousands of (laughs) subscribers. So I'm sure it's not like I just found this guy. And I'm like, hey, (laughs) everybody. you found him. (laughs) But in it, he discusses a lot how a lot of this research and stuff has pointed to like science and religion possibly being the same things. Like the what science describes as you know, um, in scientific terms of how the universe was formed and stuff could be the same thing that religion talks about as a God or a higher power. We just are using different semantics, but really it's all the same thing we're explaining. And we're all just part of this collective consciousness of energy that makes up the universe. And when he said, so what is God? Well, we all are. My mouth literally dropped and I was like, (gasps) what? (laughs) Because, I mean, the thought is if, and I'm probably getting a little ahead of ourselves because we will talk about the absolute, but while I have kind of a grasp on this, I'm going to go ahead and say it, but this absolute is kind of like the base of the universe and where all of our collective consciousness um, goes. And so like, even when we die, you know, our energy doesn't die and our consciousness doesn't die. So it goes back to this absolute, which is where everyone's collective consciousness is. And the goal is you take what you've learned and take it back there. So then it's everything, you know, is swirled around. So hopefully the more everybody learns and brings back the good things of how to, have a better, more more harmonious world, then the energy gets sent back out into new human bodies. And hopefully we, you know, we get better instead of worse. And I started thinking like, that just isn't happening though. We instead Mm. are getting worse instead of better. And he his, I don't remember the man's name, but he's he has a fish called Hecklefish, and it's just this Wi-Fi little sidekick. Guy. It's like this little fish, but it has one of those mouths that's like upside down and talk, you know, <laughs> when you can do like a little filter, and it just like makes these jokes, and it's very <laughs> it's a funny. Perfect companion. Yeah. He, and it's like edited so well. It's very, very well done. But it made me bum to think that all of the stuff that we're taking back is getting like re-spit out into the universe in a way that isn't intended because the absolute is intended to promote harmony and unity. And I hope that maybe we start taking away all the good stuff. And if we live our lives where we're like experiencing more good things and learning the more positive way to do stuff, then when we do leave this realm, those are the experiences that get put back into the absolute and therefore more good is going to be shot back out into the universe than bad. And I will now get off of my kind of um, incoherent (laughs) 
soapbox rant. Your, your cosmic soapbox. No, it's interesting that you say that because, and we'll we'll get more to it. But all all that to say, the Zen teacher that I like to follow, Bernie Glassman, was a like a uh, he was like an aerospace engineer. So it it cracks me up that oftentimes people who are will get really into more of these kind of like unification. We're all one thing. This this model in religion and this air, esoteric thing matches this physics model and mm-hmm. and even like really high level thinking quantum physicists are like oh yeah i'm not going to say god's not real i can see science and i can't tell you what is in his i'm like the fact that we you what do you mean you don't know why we sleep i thought y'all had that on lock <laughs> what <laughs> no like, i guess so somebody someday just was like i've had enough and passed out and woke up 8 hours later and was like <laughs> man i feel God great <laughs> And then that was just how it started. And then someone else was like, I'm not going to sleep at all. And then they lost it. They're yeah. like, just hold them down until they fall asleep. Mm-hmm. Play these songs to them. But no, I don't think you're uh, you're off base whatsoever. I, I wonder if, I'm going to save it for so what do we think, but I, I wonder if our current connection is... Um, in a, a very positive thing. So I'll put, put a pin in that for So What Do We Think. Sinisterhood will be right back. We all know there are things in life you have to compromise on. Like I was just on a long road trip and you have to compromise on what music you play. <laughs> AKA, I was in shotgun, ergo, I got to pick the music. Mm-hmm. But my husband had veto power. So it was, it was a compromise. I chose it. He would go, not, I can't, not another Taylor Swift song. <laughs> so I, you compromise. And that's not something you want to do, though, when it comes to your health and doctors and someone who's going to maybe work on you in a way. That's mm-hmm. why you got to use a trusted app so you're not compromising. You're getting what you want to get. You got to use ZocDoc, the place where you find and book doctors who will make you feel comfortable, listen to you, and prioritize your health. And you can search by location, availability, and insurance. So literally no compromises here because with ZocDoc, you've got more options then you know, I just used ZocDoc yesterday because you know what else is great about ZocDoc? Once you find a doctor through them, you can just open the ZocDoc app and make an appointment with your doctor via the app. It was literally the easiest thing I've ever done. It was like, next appointment for this doctor, Friday, 1 or 1.30, which do you want? I selected one. It was like, great, you're confirmed. I didn't have to call anybody. I didn't have to talk to anybody. It already stores your insurance card, so your doctor has it, so you don't got to worry about showing that. It's so simplified because insurance... And just medical stuff is already so complicated. So anything that can be done to streamline that, huge fan. We're living in the future with ZocDoc, true. That's why I love it. I'm like, would we just call people out of a phone book before? You didn't know (laughs) if they're wacko or whatever. It's like, I I know I got me a good doctor with Mm -hmm. these patient reviews. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. Go to ZocDoc.com slash creepy and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash creepy. ZocDoc dot com slash creepy. Sinisterhood will be right back. McDonald included discussions of quantum physics to describe the nature and functioning of the human consciousness, as well as theoretical physics to explain the character of the time-space dimension. He wrote, This paper will require not only logic, but a touch of right brain intuitive insight to achieve a complete, comfortable grasp on the concepts involved. The report delves into how the brain works. Importantly, it delineates between the left brain, which is useful for screening incoming stimuli, and the right brain, which manages the sensory motor cortex and pleasure centers of the brain. In hypnosis, distracting the left hemisphere of the brain allows hypnotic suggestions to pass unchallenged into the right hemisphere, where they will be acted upon directly. Transcendental meditation works similarly, where the practitioner works to focus their mind to draw concentrated energy up through their spinal cord by quieting their left brain through focus and concentration. 
the way Bob kind of described it, he's like, in hypnosis, you want the left brain asleep yeah. so that suggestions can go straight in. But he said in this, he said you want just a tiny sliver of a fingernail of the left brain still able to help you navigate and process things, but it can't be so loud that it's like, this is not real. You're dreaming and making this mm-hmm. up. It's like that part has to be quiet and go to sleep for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> to let, to, And I saw several people that explained this like in I think it was that video of like hypnosis like if you see a hypnotist and a guy clucks like a chicken it's because they've used techniques to like quiet and kind of put to sleep that left brain so the right brain's just like yeah that sounds great I'll cluck mm-hmm. like a chicken when if you were awake the left brain would be like nah you're gonna look like an idiot in front of all these people don't cluck like a chicken but that part has gone to sleep And I would say um, in this scenario, I'm probably the left brain who's like, don't do it. (laughs) And then (laughs) you are the right brain who's just jumping at everything to do it. But occasionally I'm like, I get quieted down enough to where I just give enough helpful advice, but the fun stuff can still happen. (laughs) Well, and that's why the screening of stimuli is important because I think otherwise someone going, as soon as a bell rings, you're going to be knocked down, drag out drunk. Your left brain was like, well, I haven't had anything to drink, so no, I won't. But mm-hmm. but putting that to sleep, it's like, ding, and you're like, I don't know what's going on with me. Mm-hmm. That freaks me out so much. I'm always like, are people just making up the hypnosis or is it real? And I think in some cases it's real. Like, they really can't control themselves. It's like reflexive. Yeah, I think I've talked about before how I believe it was senior prom at like the lock-in afterward. They had a hypnotist. And a bunch of seniors call, got called up on stage. And this girl that was like very much like preppy, a cheerleader, like very nice girl was sitting next to this guy who like, I mean, they I probably didn't even know each other and stuff. And the hypnotist was saying stuff and was she like basically just like slumped over And kind of had her head like on this guy. And I'm like, knowing her, this would never happen if she was like fully in her right state of mind. And she would not have done that. No, no, no. I don't think so. I think she really was like um, heavily influenced, not under like drugs or alcohol, but just like under the power of suggestion to where that part of her brain did quiet down. And like she did it. And then. One of my other friends who had also been called up to do it, like at some point they all get sent back to their seats. And then, you know, the hypnotist had told us when everybody was under, okay, when I say this word, they're all going to stand up and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. So then that happens. And then later I was like, did that really happen? She was like, well, I was kind of playing it up a bit. So I think it could go either way, but The one that that slumped over onto the guy who they were in total different, um, they were in total different like groups of, you know, people that would hang out with each other. Their paths did not cross. So she was pretty like preppy and and, um, wouldn't just wouldn't do something like that. So I always think back to that and think, I really think she was under the power of this suggestion. It's wild how that mm-hmm. it, our brains can be tricked and manipulated, whether through h- hypnosis or these sounds of yeah. like, oh, your brain's like hearing something that's not really there. It's just doing math. Mm-hmm. McDonald describes the gateway process as a training system designed to bring enhanced strength, focus, and coherence to the amplitude and frequency of brainwave output between the left and right hemisphere so as to alter consciousness, moving it outside the physical sphere so as to ultimately escape even the restrictions of time and space. The Monroe Institute measures such brainwave output as... A state of consciousness defined when the EEG patterns of both hemispheres are simultaneously equal in amplitude and frequency. The hemisync process uses audio cues to achieve a state of brainwave synchronization that leads to an altered state of consciousness. In this state, the report theorizes, consciousness separates from the physical body and can interact with a pure energy field potentially even influencing reality through a connection to the universe's energy field. The report quotes Melissa Yeager, a trainer at Monroe, saying, 
Studies have shown that a subject with 20 years of training in Zen meditation could consistently establish hemisync at will, sustaining it for over 15 minutes. The tapes developed by the Monroe Institute are designed to help users skip the 20 years of Zen training and, with practice, achieve hemisync on demand in a shorter time frame. Well, that's a quick hack. If you can do that, there's <laughs> 20 the years book. down to a week is a quick <laughs> hack. That's a quick hack. All right. It just, it just sucks into your brain so fast. But that book, Altered Traits, that I've been reading about the benefits of long term meditation on your brain, it literally does change the physiology oh, yeah. of your brain. And so it's like if you can make measurable differences by a practice, one could say, like I said earlier, a brain can get tricked. Like Nate mm-hmm. gets he's so good about that. He's like, our brains are so dumb. We can just be like, I'm going to leave five minutes early. I'm going to set that clock. And he's like, we know what time it is, but you're just tricking yourself. But it's like if you can do it either through Zen training or if it's this, it achieves the same results measurably, it's like – is it really any different if no. you're if it's measuring exactly the same? It's kind of like manifesting or what the mm-hmm. secret proposed and all of that stuff of like, well, if you think about it and you will it to come, then you can perhaps alternate the course of reality. But also perception is reality. So even, you know, which is why like when I'm having – um, catastrophic thoughts and stuff, even though I know they're not real, like my body reacts as if they were. So if I'm thinking about like a worst case scenario of what could happen with something, I physically like start to panic and feel my heart rate increase and can feel that anxiety because my brain is reacting as it would if I were really experiencing that because it doesn't know the difference between thinking about it and actually being there. Because our brains are dumb. They don't know the or difference. Or they're in so smart that they're protecting us from everything. Maybe it's yeah. us that are, we are but meat sacks. And Truly. our consciousness is what makes us all different. And um, mm-hmm. it's, I'm telling you, the video I watched, it all made sense. And it's, it's one of the, this whole thing has been like, I totally understand this. When I'm reading or watching something and then immediately after I'm like, Oh, God, quantum mechanics. How do I explain <laughs> this? But it, it is really interesting to think that if everything, if if the whole like universe is just one big energy field and we all came from that same energy field, we're all made from the same stuff. And when our physical bodies are no more in our consciousness, which is our energy goes back into that collective consciousness and just gets redistributed, the better we live our lives and the more positive, you know, and um, content we become with ourselves. And I think a lot of that comes through meditation, which is something I'm really trying to work on too, like being more present and in tune with my body. And I really want to make like these big life changes that I see like, not just like a little change here and there, but like an overhaul to where I'm like, I read this whole thing about this guy that was like, one of my biggest fears is that I'll never really know myself. And I was like, God damn, now I have another biggest fear too. Because who really can say like, you really know yourself because we all get into these like habits and patterns that we've learned and stuff. But if you strip all that away and really focus on like, you, where could that get you? And then when that gets put back into the collective consciousness, you may have left this realm, but the good that you did will continue on in other ways. Yeah. I'm part of my, my Zen study is that we, we are all connected all the time right now. So what you do do right now matters. And like, that's why it is important to be present and that I, the concept of oneness and we're all kind Mm -hmm. of reflective pearls and Indra's net. So I was, uh, very pleased the reading the CIA report because I was like, Oh good. This tracks with what I've been doing. Fantastic. (laughs) I haven't been tricked again by another fake cult that I accidentally followed. This is a real thing that lots of people do. But doesn't it suck? that they're like oh so this whole thing could like unify everyone and it's all about peace and happiness let's find out how we can use it for war and to get intel on our enemies it's like why did the government have to come in and fuck it all up again 
<laughs> I just like that McDonald's like, you wanted me to analyze this? Okay, cool. Here, Here's my analysis. And it wasn't like, here's how we'll manipulate it. Mm-hmm. It was just like a really thoughtful, like, uh, like I did it and it was great. Yeah. Here's some info on it. And they're like, General McDonald, you're fired. <laughs> This was and um, not what we the asked guy for. on the Y file breakdown said, like when he was reading it, it sounded as if he was just kind of talking about how he thinks this could be a tool for, you know, uh, being more mindful and and peaceful mm-hmm. and unification, and that at the end he kind of had to bring it back to so therefore the military blah blah blah, yeah. but he was like. It felt almost kind of forced. Like he, that wasn't where this journey had led him, but he kind of had to like shoehorn it in there because that's what his mission was. But it really did change him on a different level that I don't think he was expecting. No, that's what I got from reading it. Like he, he wrote it in a very kind of detached manner, but, um, but there we'll get to page 25, Mm. but the tone definitely shifts towards the end for sure. And is like, uh, almost like throwaway towards the end. But yeah, Mm -hmm. I got the the feeling that McDonald was changed by this. And then that the spying on the enemy book, I think it's, or reading the enemy's mind. They talk about going to that together and like how they, they enjoyed it. They liked Mm -hmm. it. (laughs) Although Paul Smith goes, the author of that book that went through it with Colonel McDonald and he goes, Telling about your hemisick experience, someone else is like telling about a dream and no one really cares. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to leave those out for you guys. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Psychiatrist Dr. Stuart Twimlow measured the brain focus output of those using hemisync tapes and concluded. The tapes encourage the focusing of brain energy. It can be measured as with a light bulb in watts into a narrower and narrower frequency band. He compared it to the concept of one-pointedness in yoga, translated into Western terms as single-mindedness. The metaphor used in the CIA report was that of a lamp and a laser, where the lamp represents our brain in everyday wakefulness, and the laser represents our brain focused at these higher levels. I found this very interesting because I love an analogy and a metaphor when it's something like this that it's very hard for me to grasp, but the lamp kind of cast a light over all sorts of stuff and it can be kind of all encompassing and a bit chaotic, but a laser is focused on one thing. So if we can harness our energy and our mental energy to focus on that one thing, then we can achieve these higher levels. And that the idea of oneness and bringing your brain to that focused area there, the times that I've been super consistent with my Zazen sitting, there's been times when like, I feel like I can, I won't say like I can see the matrix, but I do feel very connected and a huge sense of calm comes over me. And I've had visual, um, I don't say like stimuli, but like visual visualizations that I haven't seen since I was like a kid. So that I remember like memories as a kid. From when you were a kid. No, not even memories. I remember when I was a kid, I used to like, uh, God, I'm going to sound like I stare at the ceiling fan, but I would just like stare for long periods of time or like sit for long periods of time or would like hold my, like cover my eyes without being asleep. And I, apparently that's, I wasn't doing it intentionally to meditate, but I just do it because I don't know, I was a weird kid laying around, but I had forgotten these visual stimuli I had seen. And it wasn't Mm -hmm. until through consistent meditation, I literally went, (gasps) Cause I was like, oh my God, my, my eyes haven't like, I haven't seen something like that in my visual field since I was like 10 years old. Like wow. I felt a weird, like, oh my God, I'm back. Like I had mm. been so distracted by so much noise for so long that I was like, oh, I've been like under a pile of junk. And I've just been like through therapy, through meditation, through journaling, just getting the junk out of the way. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, my, I got my brain back. <laughs> I was like, hooray, I missed you. That's awesome. So that idea of like that pointedness and it's from mm-hmm. that, that staring in the Zazen setting that I was like, I see you. I see you. I can laser too sometimes. Not got to laser Bob level. <laughs> Lasers. Laser time. The goal of Hemisync is to have the brain and body tuned to the same frequency as one another and the same frequency as the Earth, creating a resonance with the Earth's electromagnetic sphere. This creates a surprisingly powerful carrier wave to assist the mind in communication activity with other human minds similarly tuned, according to the report. As for the unbelievability that humans may be able to travel through consciousness, McDonald reminds his reader that solid matter in the strict construction of the term simply does not exist. 
Pulling from concepts in subatomic physics, McDonnell writes, The point to be made is that the entire human being, brain, consciousness, and all, is, like the universe which surrounds him, nothing more or less than an extraordinarily complex system of energy fields. Those complex systems of energy fields work together to make up one gigantic hologram of unbelievable complexity. Drawing on the research of a neuroscientist at Stanford and a physicist at the University of London, McDonnell illustrates how the brain functions in relation to the surrounding universe, comprising a consciousness energy grid. Inside this grid, perception, consciousness, and the electrostatic fields of the mind work together to create the universal hologram. I do appreciate, too, that he brings in different scientific research and applies it to what the Monroe Institute is doing. And this blows my mind. The fact that nothing yeah, is Yeah, this kind of fucked me up. Uh, just this whole concept of everything is energy vibrating at such a force that some things we see, some things we don't. So there could be things around us that, like, we can't even see or detect. But it also made me think, and I've thought about this before, but like I really started thinking like the things I see are could be totally different that even our house, like when I walk mm -hmm. into our house and the way I perceive it and look at it probably isn't the same way Tommy does. But mm -mm. like we never know that because we can't see the world through another person's eyes. So it's just mind-boggling to think like what I see I think oh this is also how like you probably see this picture and these colors and how it's put together but that's not necessarily true yeah right it's uh that's why I like that Bernie Glassman book with Jeff Bridges of like that's just like your opinion man right. <laughs> there's no there is no universal truth because it all gets filtered through our perception so you can think you're right about something you're so so right about it and that's just like your opinion man mm -hmm. and I think part of that uh, unlearning of and the thing that keeps us separate because the oneness of the universe I think is what attracts me at least is in practice and I think what is in the realm of uh, neuroscience and physics is what we're hearing from this report is sort of our natural way is that we are all part of a collective one. And so the only thing that going, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, or this is how it is, or I'm going to tell you, the only thing that that achieves is to separate us further. It doesn't achieve the goal of oneness. It's like, what's more important, this collective oneness or this like silification that we've all done with one another, uh, or done to ourselves to keep mm -hmm. us separate from one another, to go, we are very different this is very different. And so that idea of like seeing yourself in the worst of humanity and seeing yourself in the best of humanity, it's like, you are not that different. You think you're all, oh my gosh, I'm so much better than them. Or like, oh my God, I'm so much worse than them. And it's like, no, you are not either of those. Yes, you are. And no, you're not like it. You're just different. We're and all that, the same. Though. According We're all to made whom, of the yeah. same stuff. Yeah. According to whom are you better or worse or whatever? And it's like, oh, well, societal norms. Well, that's just like made up, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. so I, I appreciate that they're, he, he brings in neuroscience, physics, quantum mechanics to kind of go all being one part of thing of everything is, is kind of nature. Like mm -hmm. we are all one thing. You realize that, right? And everyone's like, no, I wear this color t-shirt and you wear that one. And therefore we're different. And it's like, no, man, that's all that whole, that t-shirt. You don't even know what color that is. Cause you say it's blue. I say it's cerulean. They say it's aqua. Like, who says what is what, like what color? And also are. like your blue could be my red, you know? I yeah. mean, like who's, who knows who sees what we mm -hmm. only know our own, um, reality, mm -hmm. our own perception. Yeah. The concept of the universal hologram is theorized to be responsible for all transcendental experiences, paranormal events, and even normal perceptual oddities. The report includes a quote from author Marilyn Ferguson commenting on the work of Stanford researchers in the subject of holograms, explaining, The holographic model marries brain research to theoretical physics and takes the paranormal and transcendental experiences out of the supernatural by explaining them as part of nature. Which I think would be, oh, I saw a ghost, and it's like, no, you didn't. You saw some energy globule that you weren't supposed to really see, or you happened to see it because you were half asleep, half awake, or Bob is sneaking up on you while you're on the toilet. <laughs> if everything is happening all at once, mm -hmm. past, present, and future, then depending on how in tune you are with your energy fields and universe, you might see other things. 
Yeah, perceive other things or especially if an energy Bob talks about the ones not wanting to leave and go back and rejoin this collective hologram are ones that are addicted to life on Earth. Like they're so Mm -hmm. addicted to it that they you essentially get like trapped in like locale too, where you're like you it's where people who are asleep are at or where, you know, you shouldn't be stuck there, but you get so stuck there because you're so stuck about Earth and reality when it's like this isn't this isn't real. So it's Mm -hmm. fine. Just go. (laughs) The report also delves into Planck's distance, a principle in quantum mechanics that explains the outer limits of movement in waveforms. Using hemisync, the gateway experience is meant to enable human consciousness to perceive dimensions on those outermost places, traveling with our consciousness while both in our physical body and outside of it. One analogy in the report likens the universe to an ocean where the depths below represent an area of pure energy and consciousness that Bob calls the absolute. This is the area where the gateway practitioners explore, while the wavy surface above is the physical universe with which we are all familiar. McDonald brings up the Big Bang Theory and explains how it plays into the concept of a universal hologram. He quotes scientist Ben Bentov, who theorized that the jet of energy expelled when our universe was created— turned back on itself, creating an oval or egg-like shape. This is evidenced by the speed and distance of galaxies surrounding ours. Bintov's theory is that energy is generated from a white hole, moves along the outer shell of this cosmic egg, and enters an accompanying black hole where it started. And it does look like a cosmic egg. It does, yes. And the very 1983 is like, this man drew this with a pen. Like, oh, it's yeah. very clearly not like digital graphics. He's like, no. let me draw this out for you. <laughs> it's like you're just writing notes in a class in college and you just doodled a little thing in the corner to help you understand it. <laughs> McDonald concludes... By reflecting on this model, it becomes possible to see how human consciousness brought to a sufficiently altered, focused state could obtain information concerning the past, present, and future since they all exist in the universal hologram simultaneously. In the case of the future, because all of the consequences of the past and present can be seen coming together in the hologram such that the future can be predicted or seen with total accuracy. The gateway method itself involves putting extraneous concerns into a visualization device called an energy conversion box. The participant then engages in resonate tuning, where she hums along with the sounds on the tape. She then repeats an affirmation as said on the tape, reminding her that she is more than merely a physical body and deeply desires to expand her consciousness. Then the hemi-sync sound frequencies are introduced. Once the left brain is quieted and the right brain is in a state of heightened attentiveness, the participant is instructed to envision an energy balloon, which is comprised of an energy flow beginning at the center of the top of the head and extends down to the bottom of their feet, resembling the cosmic egg shape previously described. Once in the early meditative states, the participant is then invited to attain higher levels, each with their own numbers. For example, The level called Focus 12 allows the participant to engage in the problem-solving technique, where she can project a personal difficulty and see the answer in a sudden, holistic perception. Patterning is another Focus 12 technique that is more akin to the concept of manifestation. In patterning, the participant projects an objective or goal into the universe. With the intention that the desired objective is already a matter of established achievement, which is destined to be realized within the time frame specified. However, Monroe Institute trainers warn against attempting to force the pace of this process because the individual could succeed in dislocating his existing reality with drastic consequences. Focus 15, the past, and Focus 21, the future, can be achieved after the user has conquered Focus 12. These higher levels, though, are much more difficult to achieve and aren't attainable for everyone. Yeah, the idea of, like, the past that you go to this, like, wheel with spokes on it and you can, like, travel down the spoke and see. And that's what Paul um, Paul Smith, who is the uh, Army intelligence officer who wrote the Stargate book, he said he did that and he said he went down a path and that it was a – he's like, I've had dreams before, whatever. And he was like, it truly did feel like a visitation to my grandparents' farm when I was a child and that it was – like it's the things that throw me off is when this is all happening. And then the people that you visit are like, 
what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, uh, and it's like, you're not supposed to be here. Like, go. And then you're like, okay, bye. But it's like almost that they they sense you and can mm-hmm. see you. But they said 15 and 21 are really, really hard to get. Like, 15 is mm-hmm. hard to get to. 21, like, almost nobody can get to. Well, I love a challenge. So <laughs> we'll see how far <laughs> I can doing get. It. <laughs> doing but, it. But it did talk a lot about how another thing to be, like, uh, not wary about, but just aware of is – for many people, this is life-changing and it helps them calm. It helps alleviate concerns of and fears of dying, you know, and makes them more present. But for some people, it can also make them feel very detached from reality because the lines almost get blurred between these, you know, other realms that you're visiting and stuff. And then you come back here and either you feel detached because you don't feel like you belong here as much or like you're not entirely sure. Like, like my body kind of feels like in two places at once. And I can understand that where you feel kind of like disconnected and disassociated from stuff. And that I would not like. So I got to I would have to, I'm not going to just jump in and raw dog it like Bob Monroe. I'm going to find somebody <laughs> that can like guide me and help me with this. So I got a little bit of help going into it. I got some. Uh, I brought some anointing oil and sprays back from the the lovely death doula woman that I talked with, nice. and she said that would help. So uh, I'll I'll give you some of that. But uh, you're right though that the the Stargate folks, like all the officers that when the soldiers who went to the Monroe Institute to do this, they had to fill out like extensive psychological profiles beforehand. Say I'm not currently being treated for these issues. Yada yada yada. And one guy slipped through because a person who had filled out all the forms had to couldn't go at the last minute and. And you love the government's like, well, we already paid for the seat. Mm-hmm. So does anyone else want to go? And this guy they called Pemberton, which is just like a fake name that they gave him because of what happened. Uh, you don't want to blast, you know, put him on blast. But Pemberton went, did it. And that he they said he jolted up out of one of the sessions and went down to like the reception area, had stripped all his clothes off and grabbed a ballpoint pen and was <gasps> like threatening Bob's. I think it was his stepdaughter who worked as the receptionist and was like, with all my training, I could kill you with this. And like, what have you been doing with my mom? mind and was like freaking out and so he was taken to walter reed medical hospital where then the doctors go we think he's got some delusions because he was talking about a psychic spy program and his commanding officer had to be like to clarify a psychic <laughs> spy program totally true anything else you might want to help him with but yeah it turns out that like he had a series of uh significant psychological disorders that the mm. army did not know about and did not disclose to the Monroe Institute. So the Monroe Institute said, we never would have let him in and Mm -hmm. we wouldn't have gone poking around. And that's why Bob's like a lot of this and McDonald and the reporter, like you gotta, we gotta be at a baseline Mm -hmm. and then we can go delving in there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Don't just dive on in. No. Cause that the results suddenly you're shirtless yelling at Bob's stepdaughter with a ballpoint pen in your hand. I just keep thinking of the movie flatliners. And yeah, (laughs) Like such a good movie. Oh, first of all, so good. I haven't seen it in a long time, so I, I hope, hope it holds, holds up. up. <laughs> but from what I remember, it's very much kind of like this, like playing with these, towing the line between life and death, and like how far can we go to experience something on the other side, but also being able to come back to where we are. And we all saw in that stuff, followed them back, you know? Mm -mm. So, I mean, some things like if they don't get left where you, where you found them and they come back, even if you're like, okay, I'm back in my reality and you start seeing things and you're like, am I hallucinating? Is this really something? And then you don't know. And kind of the way things are set up is if you go to a psychologist and you're like, I'm seeing these people that I don't, they're like, well, we're going to put you on medication. Like most people wouldn't Mm -hmm. be like, oh, well, have you been practicing astral projection in the gateway process? Because (laughs) one of those entities may have just attached themselves to you and followed you back. You know, I mean, you're going to have to go Mm -hmm. to your death doula to get an answer like that. So (laughs) no judgment zone. Right. Which I like how McConnell like really tried to merge like the more, um, cerebral way of thinking and like metaphysical and spiritual with like the scientific. So that stigma around it is destigmatized and like maybe people are, are seeing the things they see. Like who are we to say they're not if we're saying like 
all of our perception or all of our reality is our own perception and we make that ourselves. So like, it's just your opinion, man, that I'm not yeah, seeing man. demons in <laughs> the backseat of my car. You know, yeah, that's and that that becomes the issue of like getting help from more uh, modern medical kind of stuff while also not shitting on stuff that's culturally important to people mm-hmm. and has been for millennia. So I did think this was very progressively written for a mm-hmm. 1983 U.S. government report to for be any as, government as, report. I was yes. like, this is very like Thoughtful. balanced and yeah, yeah, it's not it's not as biased as I thought it would be. No, he could have shit all over it. And he really mm-hmm. didn't. Yeah. McDonald explains in the report that the CIA's purpose to use consciousness travel for spying and information collection may not work because information distortion remains a major concern. When a participant tries traveling and bringing back information, the message can be muddied, according to McDonald, because physical reality in the present is not the only holographic influence which the individual may encounter in an out-of-body state. There are also energy patterns left by people or events occurring at the same physical site being viewed, but from the past rather than the present. In addition, since thoughts are the product of energy patterns and energy patterns are reality, it may also be possible that individuals encounter thought forms while in an out-of-body state which mingle with the physical reality and are not easily differentiated. Which they, the Monroe Institute tested this by having numbers like at a different facility across the country and being like, okay, astral projecting, get the numbers. And I want to say the most that somebody got was like seven. So it's like you could get some, but then you're like, ah, that one's kind of distorted. I can't really see it. It's kind of blurry. So, but McDonald, I appreciate, was saying like, you might want to go and spy it, you know, in this Soviet office and you think you're looking at the papers, but it could be your subconscious, a paper mm. that was there before, a little bit of the current paper that's there. He's like, it's not meant for this. Like, it's not meant for clear um, projection. And the it's linked in the show notes, but JK Ultra podcast did an interview with one of the sound engineers that created the HemiSync sounds. And he explained, like, part of this is getting your heart in resonance. You're like literally the heart, the beat of your heart in resonance with both of your brain hemispheres. And that requires like a peaceful, harmonious, unified feeling. And that is completely at odds with like, and then I'll travel through space and time Mm -hmm. and kill a person. He's like, you don't want to do that. Or get intel about a nuclear weapon weapon it's almost to kill like a person we shouldn't use stuff that's all about peace and unity for uh nefarious co- uh, games like yeah. maybe those two things shouldn't be connected yeah it's like the universe is like oh uh no nah, we're gonna hold your eyes mm-hmm. we're gonna close your eyes you can't you can't do it but it's fascinating slightly terrifying though to think like because thoughts are the product of energy patterns and those energy patterns that we create are our reality Like, how do you know what you're seeing is real or not? And again, I think that comes back to like, when you come back into your own body, like, well, now what I'm, is what I'm seeing reality or is this like a byproduct of where I was? Has a new thing been opened up to me that wasn't previously in this, in this realm that I, I, I think the, there's a lot of potential for it to be good. But there's also a lot of potential for it to mess with people a lot, especially if they're not, like, in the right mindset to be doing stuff like that. If they're already susceptible to, like, hallucinations or delusions and things, like, I think this could really be detrimental to their mental well-being. And for all the shit we talked about him sneaking up on people without their consent, I do appreciate that while he could have used this to create a cult Bob Monroe used it to create a nonprofit institute that is dedicated to researching these things and saying very clearly on the website, if you have these issues, do not do this. So mm-hmm. then the danger comes with, this is very popular on TikTok, of people going like, it's super easy. All you have to do is just do it. And like you said, what kind of catastrophes may arise from that of someone literally harming themselves, mm-hmm. kind of going into it incorrectly or without all the information or getting stuck somewhere or whatever, or thinking it's real when it's really not and thinking it's so real that it ruins their life. So or they try uh, to attack somebody with a ballpoint pen. Yeah, yeah. But when you, you weren't supposed to be in that pod in the first place. Mm-hmm. McDonald concludes the report by writing, There's a sound rational basis in terms of physical science parameters for considering Gateway to be plausible in terms of its essential objectives. 
He gives some suggestions on how it can be used and analyzed with multiple participants going through it at the same time and comparing their results. However, he warns that participants should be intellectually prepared to react to possible encounters with intelligent, non-corporal energy forms when time-space boundaries are exceeded. It's just shit that hangs on to you. Bob what? also talked about clingers. Like what does he, that he mean, came though? back with like cl- clingers on you or non-corporal like non-corporal energy forms. I mean, that's the thing too. You're going through all these different planes of uh, reality, existentialism, all this shit. I don't know what's out there. So, mm-hmm. I mean, interdimensional beings, people from other like bizarro worlds. I think um you just got to be prepared for what you might encounter and be okay with that. Mm-hmm. And like they said, uh, part of his like to-do list at the end of the report is like knowing yourself is very yeah. important. And like here, do these things first and then maybe try to do this. Mm-hmm. Don't just like jump straight into like, I'm going to locale three and I'm going to ruin some lives. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do think it's a really good tool to become more in tune with yourself and enhance your meditation practice, become more present and everything and kind of like quiet your mind and, and get more in touch with yourself. And then if all that works out, then you can try to start going to level 12 and, and uh, 15 and 21 and everything. Yeah. You got to walk before you can fly in your (laughs) dreams. Before you can fly through a building and uh, end up on the eve of some woman's house who has no idea what just happened to her. (laughs) She just pees her pants and runs in. While the full report is now available for the public to read, it was classified up until 2003. Even then, when the government declassified the document, one page was mysteriously missing. Page 25. The absence of this page caused conspiracy theories to run wild, with many believing the missing page contained the formula for achieving universal unity and harmony. In 2021, there was renewed interest in the Gateway experience as it went viral on TikTok. That popularity actually led to the recovery of the elusive page 25. Which is, we linked it in the show notes, but it's so funny that the Vice columnist just wrote about it and was like, this page is missing. And then he's like, three days after I wrote the article, the Monroe Institute emailed him and was like, are you looking for this page? We have it. Did you want it? And he's like, yes, I do very much. And they're like, yeah, for sure. You can have it. Here it is. And it was like, you could, nobody asked. They're like, well, nobody asked us about it. We were just over here doing experiments. You needed that? We've got it. We got you. And it's like, it's been missing for 20 years. What's crazy too, is it like the last sentence of page 24 is like, (laughs) and then if you do this, all of humanity will be able to and then it's like, that's where it ends. So you're like, be able to what? Like, you we're about to get the answer to everything. And you took that page out? <laughs> Convenient. Mm-hmm. The restored page 25 contains a section titled Belief System Considerations. In it, McDonald considers the religious and cultural beliefs around the world that intersect with the gateway experience. He quotes from a book about Tibetan Buddhists regarding the constant motion of the universe. He also quotes a Hindu sutra about Indra's network of pearls and calls it the classic description of the universal hologram. And I heard about Indra's pearls from Bernie Glassman teachings about all of us having a role to play in the universe, that it's this great big net and each place where the pieces of the net connect is a pearl and each of us are those different pearls and we're reflecting each other and we're also shining light on each other but no one of us can do everything on our own and so we're all like realizing we all have a a role to play in making the world a better place and taking care of each other taking care of like literally starting with yourself Mm -hmm. you have a responsibility to take care of yourself those closest to you then your neighbors then the extension 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 and understanding that no one person is solely responsible for everything so it's unfair to go well you should be doing these 53 things it's like my job in the net is to be the pearl i am and to reflect what i can you reflect what you can and if you're worrying about what i'm doing you're not reflecting what Mm -hmm. i can do you should be do you know so i loved that the description of it in it in terms of how to help others but then to also see mcdonald bring it up in like and that's pretty much what the universal hologram looks like i was like oh this all this vibes with what i already believe so Mm -hmm. i'm predisposed to already like it 
McDonald also describes how beliefs in both Eastern and Western religions, including Judaism and Christianity, are not at odds with the concept of the absolute, in which Bob Monroe has been training people to explore. Whether it be the Taurus of creation in the Christian belief system, the labyrinth as described in Greek cultures, the tree of life in Hebrew and Hindu teachings, or the Chinese spiral through the fourfold powers, McDonald concludes, The ultimate meaning is the same. Mystics the world over, it seems, have perceived the universal hologram in the same spiral form and have incorporated that intuitive knowledge in their religious writings from antiquity to present. The only difference is that modern-day scientists are approaching a classic right-brain concept with linear and logical left-brain thinking. Founded in 1972, the Monroe Institute still operates today with its beautiful, original, sprawling campus located in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. There are also campuses worldwide, with locations in Spain, Italy, France, Greece, Japan, and England. Here, workshops and retreats are held with the goal of helping people create more meaningful and joyful lives through the guided exploration of expanded consciousness. For interested participants that can't travel to one of the institutes, Online classes are available, as is the Institute's meditation app, Expand. The idea that, with the right tools and mindset, an out-of-body experience can be achieved, allowing the confines of space-time to be broken, is appealing to many. The ability to astral project and visit loved ones around the globe sounds comforting. The philosophy that we are all part of the collective consciousness that makes up the energy field of our universe is a unifying concept. Hopefully. The gateway process continues to be used to help participants achieve a transformative experience and isn't weaponized against us by the government for political gain and power. So what do we think? So I, uh, I loved Bob Monroe's book. It's a little bit like a guy just writing all of his different dreams down. But the <laughs> um, when when it does start to get more like by the third book, it's even more about like the consequences of doing what you're doing. And I thought it was extremely poignant when his wife passed away, how he, they almost had like a death doula situation where she was like put into this meditative state. She had breast cancer. So she was like on hospice. And he talked about after she passed, like this idea of not really wanting to visit her because in the first book, he went to visit these people who had passed away. And in one instance, he said, I want to see my friend, you know, his name was, uh, let's say David. He's like, I want to see David. I want to see him. And his friend was 70 when he passed. And that he said he felt this like shooting upward sensation. Like somebody was like lifting him with his arm and he got plopped down in this hospital. David was a doctor, but there's like this 20 year old doctor talking and that a voice came in Bob's ear that said, stand right here. And the doctor will We'll see you in a moment. And he said that this 20 year old was standing talking to like other doctors telling them what to do and da, 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 and then stopped and looked over and just looked at him and just stopped and then went, huh, like shook his head and then kept talking to the other doctors. And then Bob woke up. So the next week, Bob said, I want to see David. I want to see David. And this voice said, you saw him last week. What are you talking mm-hmm. about? And so he realized he had been taken to visit him in whatever form that David's consciousness took, whether that's him in the past or whatever. And another time when he went to visit someone, the person literally said, Oh, you're not supposed to be here. I'm, I'm doing like, I love you, but I'm doing this. So he had this concept by then of trying to visit people by the time his wife passed that he was like, the only people that you still visit that you still see all the time are, it's like kind of this thing we've always said about ghosts, right? They have unfinished business. Like they're too attached to this sort of physical world and not understanding that like there is so much beyond that. And whether that's like the Christian heaven that you believe in, or if you believe in, uh, you know, reincarnation or whatever, just this concept of like, there isn't a, you know, go to the lat, Carol Ann. Like <laughs> there's something else to like go to beyond that. He like loved his wife so much that he was like, if she wanted to visit me, she would visit me. I'm, I don't want to drag her back because I miss her and I'm sad. Mm. And just like seeing his experience of like, oh yeah, like I ruined this guy's life in locale three <laughs> all the way to, by the time at the end of his third book, he's like, that's such a selfish thing. I'm, I'm just going to continue to do my, ex- you know, my experiments, my practice and try to bring other people to this. I, I did at least appreciate that, um, full circle cosmic egg of Bob's life, yeah. but that kind of, you kind of realization. 
Yeah, that like realization. So I don't know. I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to let you know. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'm definitely all for it. I I think that there's, at the very least, it would help me be more um, present and help with meditation and just like anxiety. I Like I told you, I listened to that binaural beats um anxiety playlist on spotify and i rarely am able to fall asleep with music playing and i just had my earbuds in and i had set my alarm for like two hours later mm-hmm. and the next thing i know the alarm's going off and i was like what i fell asleep and like i've been asleep for that long it seemed like it went by so fast and That's i amazing. felt really refreshed i I don't remember if I dreamed then or Mm -hmm. if the horrible dream I had was um, during the night, but that's not uncommon. I have really fucked up dreams. And sometimes in like one of the things I was reading about this is as far as dreaming and people don't really know why we do it. But one of the beliefs is like you could be visiting these other type of realms. And Mm -hmm. if that's the case, They shouldn't exist because they're horrible (laughs) and awful and they're run by fucking monsters and vampires. Down. (laughs) And uh, it's just a really, it's, but it's like, it is kind of like a world like ours, but different in ways, but still some of it is familiar. Um, I just want to get to the locale where I'm like, oh, this is cool and fun and everybody's having a great time. (laughs) Maybe I need to work on myself in order to get there. Maybe we go to the places that are uh, like where we need to learn the most or kind of fight our own demons. There's a an answer within. Yeah, I think uh, there's something to be said about wanting to join that cosmic collective of of traveling through. I'm afraid of leaving my body, which is like step one in the experience, in the gateway process is like leave that fear behind. And so I'm working on the fear part. But until then, I'll just keep doing my zazen sitting and I get to look through the eyes that I looked through as a kid. And it's been great. <laughs> I don't mind the leaving my physical body part as long as I come back. But I do. Um, Grab your feet. Uh, Yeah, I got to grab my feet. But because like I have such vivid dreams and they affect me for days, weeks, months, and I can, it's like I feel how it happened. I carry it with me. My concern would be that like almost like not being able to tell like what happened or what didn't happen. Even now, sometimes I'll be like, did I dream that? Or did this really happen? Yeah, I like had some dream that like two celebrities were together, but it was so real that I had to like Google it. And I'm like, did these people get together or did I dream this? (laughs) What if they do? (laughs) Well, I wish I could remember who it was. I probably told you at some point, maybe I even mentioned it (laughs) on here, but yeah, I'm no, I'm for sure. Um, interested in it. And, the uh, Virginia campus, there's also one in Arizona. Um, mm-hmm. We got to go. Look great. And you can take like a week long retreat there. The food They're looks gonna great. Find me. They got a rose quartz I- pool. I'm all, oh, I'm, I'm in. Yeah, I'll go. I like it. We should definitely do it for research purposes. For research purposes. <laughs> yes. For well, if y'all have sure. done the gateway, write us in. I want to yeah. know if you've astral projected. Let's get a Freaky Friday going of some dope ass gateway experiences and astral projection and all that kind of stuff. For sure. I would love, love, love to hear about those. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. This episode of Sinisterhood is made possible with the help of our amazing patrons. If you're interested in supporting the show, consider joining our Patreon. You'll get access to ad-free regular episodes, weekly bonus content, you're able to vote on episode topics, join our monthly live streams, and more. Keep it creepy. Mwahaha.